Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Sam Silverman. Sam has become really a professional passive investor. He has dove headfirst into this business and became that passive investor because of the income level that he had. He had to figure out what the best way to invest that was. And we're going to get into that today, but a little about him. He is a tech sales leader that has led global organizations. He's leveraged his day job into building wealth through both both passive investing and operating multifamily apartments. Uh, But today we're going to get into how he he graduates college and then has this income that he hasn't had before and has to figure out what to do with it, right? And he goes down that path that most of us have gone down or have thought about going down, which is, you know, starting with single family homes and learn the hard way how much brain damage or, or just time has, has to be spent uh, to make that model work. Uh, but he took some big changes, learned a lot about passive investing, and now is becoming uh, active in the space as well. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Welcome to the show, Sam. A pleasure to have you on uh, as a guest. And uh, tell us a little bit about your background. I want to hear because I know you are a very active passive investor, but now some things are changing and you're, and you're changing uh, even how, you know, from the passive role to more of an active role. And I want to get into that. But uh, tell us a little bit about even your W-2 position and, and why, why invest in syndications. Yeah. Well, Whitney, thanks for having me on here. Um, big listener of, of your podcast. So definitely appreciate coming on here. Um, when looking at the, the W-2 jobs, so right out of college, got into sales. And when you look at sales, especially in tech, it's a pretty low barrier to entry job, right? Meaning that you can quickly scale and, and, and grow in the role, both in terms of position, responsibility, and more importantly, earnings. So when you look at that, you have the you know, excess cash that you, that you never had before that you're looking to, you know, what do I go do with this? Right. So that was kind of my entry to real estate and started in real estate like a lot of people do. Bought, I think, eight single family houses right out of college the first few years and realized this was not the path that I wanted to go down. I think something people miss a lot when looking at single families is just the amount of mind share and headspace that it takes up. So. I call it brain damage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's yeah, actually putting it. They, yeah, I did the same thing. You know, started just you know, and that, and that's the way I was advised by so many people who had been in the business a very long time as well. It's like you you have to start small, and and eventually you'll get there. You'll you'll grow, and you'll move from that single family to maybe a duplex and fourplex and eightplex, and you know, and after a few years, but uh, but keep going. You bought eight single family homes right out, right out of college, and but you figured out that wait a minute, there's a lot of work involved here, a lot of time. Yeah, so I was lucky in a sense when I bought them that I actually bought in the submarket of Jacksonville, Florida. So great market. I love the area, um, especially now multifamily as well. But that area, for context, I bought the first house on more or less farmland. Like they had to clear trees to even put the single house there. And now there's you no know, 30 or 40 houses within a few blocks. So the area, you know, I probably caught it in the second inning. So it's, it's moving on up probably third or fourth inning now. So been able to do a few refis on those properties, pull a lot of my cash back out of them, sold a few. Um, so really good learning experience. I think it's actually similar to, you know, what I did at first in sales, right? As an SDR function, where if you look at that role, that role is booking appointments, pass them off to more senior sales reps, and then kind of earning your stripes that way. So I view it as a really similar experience where it gives you the insight as, hey, what do you want to do? And what do you definitely not want to do? which I think is a super important part, like understanding what you don't want to do first really helps point in the direction of what you actually want to do. You need to get clear on those things, right? What you do not want to do. And tell us a little bit about you know, what were those things for you and how did that, how was that helpful? I think the biggest thing was when looking at the cash flow from the properties, right? Just kind of breaking down one property, for example, they'd make anywhere from two to $400 a month right? And giving yourself some reserves. They weren't bad properties. Like it was solid cash flow. Um, but the biggest thing was that each purchase 
was a new transaction, right? So when looking at it, it wasn't getting to scale the point where, hey, I can now replace my entire W2 income. This is a lot of freaking houses, right? You start running the math on them and that is a lot, a lot of houses, a lot of transactions, really spread out property management as well. Even if you can get them somewhere close together, right? You're still paying a premium to have those units managed. Um, and it's a lot of different transactions, a lot of tenants. I think one of the biggest things as well is that you have a single family house. Once it's vacant, you're netting zero on that property, um, which can kind of be a good pivot to the multifamily side where your break-even standpoint when looking at occupancy is so much lower than single family, right? A hundred versus maybe, you know, 60, 70%. So huge swing um, when looking at that. For sure. No doubt about it. And so you, you, know, you, you, you had this income, all of a sudden you get out of college, you're making some money. You said, you know what, I'm going to figure out what to do with this. You found real estate, you start buying single family homes, you figure out there's a lot of brain damage, <laughs> a lot of time spent, a lot of brain, just time, mental time. You know, I think you said, I mean, it's so true. So true. You know, people don't realize, uh, but you know, you buy these homes and, and I love how you say, you know, you need to know uh, you know what you don't want. And so you figure out what you do want. Uh, and so move us from there. Like, uh, how, did you buy more single family homes? What happened next? You know, what made you then look for something other than, you know, this business plan that you had? So I took on a kind of step back and started with, okay, where do I want to get to? Because at first it was just go, right? Do something, right? Better than doing nothing, at least taking some action. But then once you kind of have the momentum, you can take a step back and think, okay, start with the end in mind of where you want to get to versus what you're doing on daily basis just to push the ball forward a little bit. So from there, I looked at, okay, what is something that I can get involved in that allows me to spend almost all my focus on my day job, right? Being in sales and having a good career trajectory, your earnings are variable, right? Where if you perform better, you make more money. If you perform better, you know, typically you're in a sales or if you're in a good one, that's purely a meritocracy, right? It's not tenure-based, it's not political, right? It is solely based on performance. And it's a very metric-driven role, right? Where in certain fields, say, for example, if you're a doctor, right? You may be a great doctor, but maybe hard to quantify how good of a doctor you are. You look at sales, it is black and white, right? Age, you know, tenure, politics really don't matter, right? It's more so if you perform, you'll earn well and have a great path. If you don't, you'll likely be out of a job. So I think it was a really, really compelling area to get started in. Um, so kind of looking at the switch that I made from single family, stop buying single family, sold some off, still have a few that are actually performing pretty well. Um, Long-term tenants there. So you know, maybe once, they, once the units turn, I'll, I'll look at, at, at selling those. But for now, they're fine. Um, so did a lot of research, right, from podcasts like yours, from, you know, Michael Block, he's awesome. His podcast, great educational content as well. And then what I started doing is just learning a lot more about multifamily syndication, where all these people go on to these podcasts to talk about a topic, but if we're being transparent here, it's, it's to uh, promote their business in some way. And if you look at it, kind of my roles have been building sales orgs. And one of the biggest characteristics of building a sales org is hiring the right people. So my background is really well-versed in interviewing. So what I would do is I'd listen to, you know, podcast after podcast after podcast, find people that I thought seemed genuine, transparent, competent. And then I'd, I'd get on a call with them and I'd interview them, right? As these are people you're giving a check of, you know, $50,000 plus to that you want to feel confident in who they are as, as a person. Character is a really big thing. All these deals, you'll see the differences in terms of returns are negligible, right? They really aren't a huge swing when looking at, you know, 15% versus 17 versus 18 versus 16, right? It, it's all pretty standard. But the biggest thing that you want to see is that who is this person who gave my capital to? Like, we all know how hard it is to go make that money and actually save it, that to a point where you can go invest in a deal like this. And then more so, what's your confidence? They can go execute on, on a business plan and if they're realistic in their expectations, and provide themselves the proper buffers on either area. 
So important, Sam. I, I, I'm just, I'm grateful that you brought that up. And and so I get asked every week by numerous new investors, you know, through phone calls. They say, "What you know? What else should I be asking?" Maybe it's their first first phone call like this. Maybe they've had a few with different operators. They're like, "What else should I be asking?" And I say, "Well, there's tons of questions you can ask around location and deal and underwriting and assumptions. Like we can get into some deep weeds, right? You know, or deep water thinking about all those questions and, and get real complicated. But I tell you, you know, the first most important thing they need to be asking about or figuring out is that operator's character, right? Who, who is this person? How did they become who they are? You know, how, how, do, how have they had to operate or, or perform in difficult situations? Uh, you know, how did they become the person that they are? Are, are they going to have you in mind as the investor when hard times happen? You know, uh, and so I could not agree more that character is so important. Uh, and so you learned about syndication business, and you decided to start investing, obviously, passively, uh, as opposed to buying more single family homes. Uh, tell us a little more about that. Maybe some more ways that you vetted the first operators or those first few phone calls, things like that. Yeah. So the biggest thing I, I you know, listen to podcasts, I find people and kind of the, the, the big focus I had around them is, okay, you look at a lot of these people who are in the syndication business, they typically had a career first, right? There's very few, you know, some Maybe in that category where, you know, right out of school, they jumped into this business and worked their way up from a firm or kind of started their own thing right away. But a lot of them had careers previously. So one of the big things I looked for was, what's this person giving up, right? Like to go do this. I think sacrifice is a huge piece. And what are you walking away from? I have nothing against house flipping just to preface my next comment. But if you have, you know, person A who's flipping houses making 50 grand a year and they're going to run a syndication business, right? 50 grand, not a bad living, depending on where you are in the world, but are they giving up enough to, to see success for themselves? By looking at someone who's making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year in their previous roles, right? Building teams, scaling organizations. I feel a lot more confident with them knowing they have a family, they live in a high priced house, right? They gave up those things to go run this business versus they were taking a you know lateral step from a lower earning, lower upside type role. So what do they give up and sacrifice is really important to me, kind of knowing what they have on the line. Um, also looking at, hey, how much equity do you have in this deal personally? So I think that's a huge component of it, right? Because if you look at how these deals are structured, there's an acquisition fee. And if this small GP team, they may be able to cover their entire buy into a deal through the acquisition fee. So a question I was asked is how much capital do you and the other GPs have into this deal above and beyond the acquisition fee? And then also looking at how the deals are structured, right? So a big portion to me was that, you know, I build sales comp plans, right? I've, I've managed many salespeople, built sales teams that you want the compensation plan, for their variable earnings tied to performance, right? Where if they crush it, they should make a ton of money. And I think it's the same way for a sponsor in a deal where, their money, the bulk of it should not be made on fees, right? I think there's certain things you can charge to keep the lights on, but the bulk of their dollars should come from performance within a deal. So having them have that confidence and having them have that long-term mindset of this may take three, four, five years to see any true earnings on it, but they have enough that's stable elsewhere to provide them the income, right? I do not want someone who is banking on this deal to pay their mortgage, Right. I want someone who's stable in terms of their passive income, in terms of their properties they already have under management, that if this deal goes south or this deal takes a while to, to you know, come to fruition in a way that they planned it, that their life isn't negatively impacted in a way that they have to sacrifice certain things in this deal to make their life function. So... So important. Everything you just said, there's so many things there. I, and I want to go back just a little bit because I don't think I've ever heard anyone mention the, mention before that. Think about, uh, you know, especially a newer operator or, if, you know, if they're getting into this space, what are they giving up? I think it's a neat question just to think personally when you're talking to an operator, you're getting to know uh, that could re reveals a lot, right? About how their dedication uh, to this business and, and getting in. I, I just think that's, that's very smart. Uh, but you said, you know, look at previous careers, you know, as part of that. 
How much equity, of course, you know, are they investing in the deal and above the acquisition fee? Uh, wh- what are they, what are they making up front? And, and I would say on that note that it's important that the operators do make some money uh, up front. It costs Agreed. a lot to get a deal to the closing table. It, it costs a lot, so much time. Right. I mean, it's our also team, risk too. Right. right. That's right. Right now That's... you're seeing earnest money go hard right away to be competitive in deals where you might lose six figures in a deal if, if you have to walk away from it for the better of your investors. So I have no issue with syndicators making money up front. Yeah. I have to make sure that if this deal goes through, they're putting more into the deal than the money they're making up front. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you see some kind of 5% acquisition fee or something. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait a minute. Well, what's happening here? Uh, but, but I like how you said, you know, the, you know, GP crushes it. You know, if, if it, if they make it, if it, if, you know, if they make money as well, uh, you know, you want to make sure that your general partnership is making money if, if they are, if the deal is crushing it, you know, and they're operating it well, because you're making money too, as the past investor, you should be. Uh, but, uh, but the, you talked about, you want a GP who has some cash flow already, right? You don't want them to have to count on that next deal. Uh, and I think it's something that, you know, we've just had like two of our four large projects last year. I mean, we got 10% discounts on. I mean, $3 million off because we yeah. were just patient. You know, we were able to walk away from the broker. It goes under contract and the broker ends up coming back after it falls out of contract. We get a discount. Uh, and so you just got to be patient. In, 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 in a few of those deals as well, personally. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, you got to be patient and you cannot be, uh, you know, counting on the next acquisition fee to, to feed your family, you know, because that's when you're going to really be pressed to make some uh, bad decisions. Uh, right. So so you got into the syndication business. You started vetting sponsors. Some great questions, by the way. Uh, you know, what about that first project? How did you know that that, you know, I get that question often. Well, you know, uh, past investors, it's hard that first one. Right. Like, am I really going to hand that fifty thousand dollars I've worked so hard for to somebody? You know, how did you get past that and decide, okay, this is a great option for me. So I probably did a hundred plus hours of research from just listening to podcasts, listening to different points of view from people. Like it's awesome how much free educational content there is out right now, right? Podcasts like yours, Michael Blanc is great. Joe Fairless has a great one, right? There's all these different podcasts of educational content that you can go to, to hear people with a different perspective than you may be used to right? A lot of people I knew growing up were doing nothing like this, right? So you go talk to friends and family, then you'd be like, what are you doing, right? This is, they're the traditional, you know, put money into a 401k route, right? Say, you know, be, be a corporate jockey for 30, 40 years, and then you go retire, right? Where it's a whole different mindset of buying back your time and your freedom to, mm-hmm. to do those things that you, you want to do, right? So I was a big enough believer in it where, I was open to taking that risk, right? And the way I view these deals as well is like the risk, the biggest risk in these deals is the illiquidity. That's it. Because you're buying a tangible asset, right? You're not buying a stock where the CEO goes on, you know, gets caught doing something they shouldn't be doing and the stock gets, you know, cut in half overnight or new policy changes and the stock can drop, right? I think it's a really nice thing that you can't sell these deals quickly, right? So people get super emotional with money where if you're watching your portfolio and it's going up and down and up and down, right? There's some, there's some stomach ache there, right? I worked for, for a public company previously that great company, but super vol- volatile, right? A, a beta of close to two. So, you know, looking at that company and, and I had equity in that company as well, right? Watching it, not the best feeling, um, watching your money go up and down that you've worked so hard for, where with these deals, it's, you know, you're putting into a tangible asset, that's, you know, extremely recession resistant relative to other assets that people will always need a place to live. And kind of back to one of my earlier points too, is like when you look at your break even occupancy, you're anywhere from, you know, 55 to maybe 70% on the super high end of break even. So if you look at it as, yeah, there's, there may be a risk of illiquidity yield holding for longer than it should, but this deal will still cash flow, you know, six, eight, 10% while you're holding it as a worst case scenario, right? So like I view it as really safe in that sense. Um, actually the first deal I invested with was, was with you, um, through, through someone else, but, but with you. Um, so yeah, good experience so far. Awesome. I appreciate the kind words and, and honored that, uh, that you did that. And, and, you know, tell me, uh, you know, and what were a couple of things that made you comfortable even investing with us personally? So the person I invested with 
um, had a really similar profile to what I wanted to do longer term. Um, his role was more so on the capital side, worked with investors, right? had a similar story, um, actually played baseball too. So it was really similar type, you know, comfortability with that person. Um, and then also we were just more so willing to take the risk of, hey, if this doesn't work out, the worst thing and my money's tied up for a few years and I, I you know, say I break even on it, right? Not a huge risk. Um, so more so just knew I had to do something. You know, I'm more of a person who feels more risk not taking action than taking action. So I, I don't, you know, I have a little bit less guardrails than others may have in that sense. Um, but yeah, once, you know, started seeing distribution, felt very, very comfortable going and doubling down in that area. And more so, I think the biggest thing that I appreciated was the communication style, right? So for me, seeing, you know, monthly updates, right? Seeing progress in terms of videos and pictures, that's super important, right? So understand the communication style, the person you're investing with needs to be there, right? So if you're someone who likes being texted daily about a deal, right? You're going to have a really tough time finding a sponsor that aligns to your interests, right? So understand the communication style, right? Some better than others, right? For me, if I get a monthly update, see things are fine, you kind of put on autopilot there, right? Once the first few, hey, things are going well, there are typically a similar format as well when looking at the deal updates. So you can get really accustomed to, okay, these are the two areas you need to look at. Anything that's a red flag, you kind of look it over and then see next month how that changed. Um, but it's a business, right? You look at the financials, you look at the kind of high level overview. And outside of that, there's nothing to really dig into, which is the biggest appealing part to myself and probably others who are, you know, high W2 earners looking to create passive income where they um, want to be hands off, right? You want to write a check, you want to see the updates, you want to collect the distribution, you want to allow all that mind share to go towards whatever you're doing in your day job, right? Whether it's your family, whether it's a, you know, high performance job that gives you upside in terms of variable compensation or equity, right? It allows to be hands off and, and get that time back in mind share. Or if it's down the road and, and you're using it to buy your freedoms so that you don't have to do things you don't want to or feel absolutely right doing, right? I've seen people at W2 jobs later in their career who look freaking miserable. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're likely there because they're, if a family, they're supporting someone, they're supporting themselves. So it, it, it's just a clear path of, you know, you look at the risk of doing it versus not doing it. The risk of not doing it is ending up in a job you freaking hate when you're, you know, in your fifties and you're just doing this because you have to feed your family or yourself. Um, so I think that's the bigger risk of, of not doing anything versus doing something. I love that thought process of, uh, I just say you said for yourself, bigger risk, not doing something than doing something. Uh, yeah. The opportunity loss, right. Uh, and, and the learning experience, I would say also, even if it's a wrong move, I mean, if you didn't take it, you didn't learn anything, you didn't grow and you're probably still going to make a wrong move just later. <laughs> right? Uh, you could have already got that done. Uh, and so, uh, no, that's awesome. Well, uh, we got to move forward a little bit, uh, but I want to, I wanted to also, you speak to going from passive to thinking more about being active and why you would do that and kind of where you're at in that process. Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted to go active down the road. I just didn't think it actually be this quickly. Um, so I think it actually ties back to sales as well, right? Like you look at sales and you look at the profile of buyer who you're selling to, the closer you understand who that buyer is and the better you know what they actually care about, not just, hey, the surface level, like they focus on A, B, and C, but like actually getting in the mind of how they think, that's how you can be really successful in sales. And so you look at, think of capital raising for deals as sales, right? You're basically selling a yourself and a potential deal. And if you look at it, like I'm the exact profile of person you want to go bring into a deal as an investor. So what I was realizing is that I had tons of friends and colleagues ask me, hey, you know, whatever you're doing next, like, let me know type scenario. So from there, really looked at how could I get involved into deals, right? So um, definitely bothered people. I invested with quite a bit to understand what they were doing. I almost used the deals I invested in personally as a very well-paid educational course, mm -hmm. right? So you see how they communicate, right? What goes into a deal, what to look for, what questions are investors asking on webinars and things like that? So kind of figuring out, I'm a big believer in kind of owning your niche, right? Like pick one lane and go very, very deep versus being a jack of all trades, master of none. So I figured on the side of it, hey, if I understand how potential passive investors are thinking, 
where I can likely help pool a lot of these people together for deals, um, also help in other areas of deal due diligence, property management, et cetera, but more so really understanding how do these investors want to be courted, right? Taking kind of the sales tech prospecting to investing, which I think is not done at all today. Um, and kind of seeing, hey, there's a big need and also a big opportunity to educate, right? Like I knew people making multiple seven figures a year who have no clue about this. They're plugging their money away in freaking index funds. So like, I think there's an opportunity both where, you know, like it's really powerful selling something that you genuinely believe in and you genuinely feel as though if someone buys it, they're in a better place than they were previously. So I think all of that really clicked for me. And it's kind of looking at partnering with operators to, you know, give more people access to deals like this that they never knew about. No, that's awesome. I just think you see a great opportunity there. And, and I, you know, even earlier in our conversation, you were talking about some of your abilities to, to hire and to find people, you know, and, and hiring the right people and the importance of that. And sounds like, uh, you know, you talked about staying in your lane and focusing on certain things. It's, you know, all that's kind of connected. Uh, and I know we've experienced that. It's like, you know, if I can focus on something, it's so much faster and I can do it so much better uh, than trying to be a jack of all trades like you were talking about. And so building that team is so important. But even in your space, or like you were talking about directly, focusing on one thing, you're going to go so much further and, and know it so much better, right? And you're going to find those other people that that complement your skills. Uh, but Sam, I meant to ask you as well when you I, on the passive investing side, though, when you're when you're talking to that operator, how do you like to hear things like you know when they're, how they're prepared for a downturn or what are they I mean, what do they expect coming you know over the next six months to twelve. Uh, you know, in the market or, you know, as you're a passive investor speaking to operators, what do you like to hear as far as being prepared for downturn? So I don't really ask markets like specific questions. I more said like, hey, walking through a scenario when shit hit the fan, how do you react to that? Right. Walking through the entire way it played out, because that'll dictate more so how they handle something poorly. Right. People can get very, very emotional in reaction. I think being in, in sales leadership, you kind of lose the right to do so. So understanding people and having people who can handle, you know, things burning around them, you know, and they're not going to tell you it's all, you know, I, I've had previous people I've worked for and with who things were burning around them. They were smiling. Like, I don't want that. Right. But the way I view it is I want someone, if you look at it from, you know, a one being the worst day ever to a 10 being, you know, you won the freaking lotto. I want someone who lives in the six all day long, right. They're slightly, you know, pessimistic, but still can get stuff done. Right. So I think people looking at like a very clear lens and don't swing either way, right. Being in that, you know, five to seven range, six range, if you can stay in that lane and kind of be that person consistently, you'll figure stuff out. So really just hearing, Hey, when stuff goes totally wrong, how do you handle it? Because I'm a big believer is that these deals will pan out. Things may take longer than normal, but the market goes in a downturn for a year or two, right. Two years, three years, just hang on to the deal. Right? If the fundamentals are good enough in the market and the operator and the deal itself, it may just be a longer illiquidity period. But I think overall, it's going to pan out in a way that you'll be happy with. And especially right now, I'm a big believer in inflation is coming in a big way. We've pumped more money into this economy than we have in the past 100 years in the last you know, 18 months. So if people think inflation aren't coming, like buy things that are tangible assets that will go up with inflation. So I'm a big believer in, in that for sure. And yeah, so many great things there. Unfortunately, we've got to move move forward. But a couple of final questions, Sam. I wanted to ask you, number one thing that's contributed to your success? Getting really good at things people hate doing. So if you look at it in sales, right, it was prospecting. Like you look at my you know, first couple of jobs, I was working probably 100-ish hours a week the first few months. And because of that, I was going to pick out of the bullpen to go build teams and kind of latch on to people who are super successful. So like do the work up front and do the things people hate doing. If you get good at those things, you will always have people who want to pay you a lot of money to go do those things because it's, they don't want to do it. And right? there's a huge value in doing so. And how do you like to give back? So I try and spend quite a bit of time coaching, um, whether it's my reps internally, whether it's people getting started, um, I'm also a big believer and I don't donate any money right now, but down the road when I pass away, I'll be giving giant chunks of capital to, to areas. I feel more confident in, in myself managing it until that point versus others. Um, but down the road, likely the goal is to start a foundation. 
I'm a huge animal guy. I have dogs all over the place. So likely focused around, you know, humane rights with, with animals. Sam, grateful to have had you on the show. I just think you've added so much value to the passive investors that are listening. I know many of our past investors listen and many others. Uh, and so I just know, you know, they, they all they all wonder about these questions they should be asking and how they vet sponsors and how other past investors have done that. And so I just think you've added a ton of value. So grateful for that. And uh, just to get to know you even personally better and hear your story, uh, tell the listeners though how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. So LinkedIn, I'm super active on there. Sam Silverman, my current company is for metric or go to my website, silvermancapital.co. Um, great place to, to get in contact with me there as well. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.